It's great to meet you. Good to meet you as well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you bet. I really have enjoyed your music. I've already played it on the show, so I'm looking forward to getting into it. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. You bet. So before we get into A Window Within, I want to know, you know, four years ago, we were really trying to figure out how this pandemic was going to shake out, how long it was going to last, all the ramifications. How did you ultimately survive that time period? And how did it influence this project and what you do now? Um, That's a really good question. Uh, I think the world stood still for me, honestly. Uh, Everything got very quiet. Um, In my own personal life, there were a couple losses of of the elders. And I have my father's side of the family is here. I'm actually in Italy right now as we speak, um, visiting his family and um, just being so far from every, my mother's side of the family is in California. And of course, when things started shutting down, um all of a sudden i really felt the isolation we're out on long island and then it was just the four of us and luckily enough i have twin boys so they were able to keep each other company but everything that was me and my identity and my music um from family all the way to career just kind of stood still um so lonely uh incredibly lonely i gotta say and very difficult emotionally I think I am someone who's always been very extroverted. I've always loved working with students. I've been working with students in the music sphere, uh, whether it's workshops, one-on-one lessons, um, you know, sitting in with other people as guests. It's just been kind of my life, whether it was the conservatory in Brooklyn or the New York Jazz Workshop or on my own. So not having access to humans that I'm so used to having and sharing that energy and sharing that space was incredibly difficult. And then you know, there were a couple when things started shaking again a little bit in the music, it was I was asked to do a couple concerts and then, you know, one was like an opening for an art gallery and all of a sudden there were hundreds of people and some were on masks and some weren't and I was expected to wear a mask. I was trying to sing across the mask like this and I was just like, I, I can't, I don't even, I think I, I teared up and I just left. It's like, you, you do, I'm not, this is not something I can do. Luckily, I had a friend who started a writing group um, different sort of Americana, you know, uh, everyone was coming from a different, different background, not too much jazz in this writing group. And he said, you know, Liv, why don't you just, why don't you just write, just, just write a few things for our group. And every week someone will give some kind of parameter and we have to follow the parameters. And so that kind of started, at least I was still had my creative juices flowing a little bit. Um, so I wrote a couple tunes during that, none of which made it to the to the record um but i started at least writing things penning things down and kind of playing more on my own playing piano getting getting more into really helping my kids develop further with their own instruments one's a pianist they're both eight um one plays guitar so it was fun to sit in with them um and kind of close ourselves in our world and then with the loss of my grandmother's which happened at about one month interval from each other none of whom I was able to really mourn with my family and not being able to bury your own or mourn with your family is uh, something that is was alien to my thought process and was alien to my being. So it was very difficult for me, especially one in particular, Joan Martin, who's uh, someone that I dedicate the record to or in memory of her. She was someone who changed my life. She was a big band. She, I still play on her piano. Um, she was a big band fan. And so up until the end, I was kind of, I was able to be with her until things started shutting down and I would play Count Basie and I would play um, Duke Ellington and you know, her foot was still going on the two and the four and she was still swinging really hard. Um, And then they shut things down and I had to go back to New York. And the idea of not being able to have a ceremony for her and to remember this incredible human who changed so many lives and she was ahead of her game in so many ways. So that kind of led me to write um, Nona. And that for me was a really cathartic process. And so then from there, I kind of, I knew that there was something to remember her by, and there was some way for me to process that loss. And then I started thinking, you know, God, how many teenagers missed their graduation? How many kids missed, you know, an outing or, or like how many of us missed, and it doesn't have to be a human, but just this idea of like loss and, and how do we process that? And so I kind of wrote Nona with, with the idea that it might help 
other people process their losses, regardless of what shape or form they might have. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of a long winded answer to your yeah, question. Yeah, no, it's great. No, and that's what I'm looking for. So how does this release feel for you, a window within? What, what, what does this release mean for you? For me, it was reawakening. Um, Mauricio originally came to me, we, we play together in a different project. We play for Reza Khan, who's a great guitarist originally from Bangladesh and a uh, different style of music. And he, um, Mauricio came to me, we, we really gel rhythmically. Um, he's a phenomenal drummer, just a good friend. And he said, you know, why don't we do a record of your songs? And I said, Mauricio, I don't have enough songs. I said, well, what are you waiting for? <laughs> So I, I tried to censor that. He's like, get writing. So I said, well, I don't, I don't know. I got, you know, I got a couple of, so I started writing and, and that for me was, was amazing because I realized that, you know, I still, it had been, gosh, I think five years or so since my last record. Um, and in my last record, I tried to write a couple extra tunes, but they were kind of cut out. Um, it was, it was a very different approach, I think, to recording in general. Um, this one, I just, it was more about like, what do I have to say? And how does my life in the last four or five years, I guess, four years, um, how does this kind of come together at this point? Um, so, so all the songs have definitely, they, they mark very specific moments throughout this. Um, and I open with Caught Me By Surprise, which is a tune actually that's about meeting my husband when we did, and this was in 2010. So this was before the pandemic. Um, but just being able to pen that and actually honor that. And um, yeah. So what are you hoping the listener gets from this album? Um, I hope that I think there are three things that I was going for. One was joy. I think it's a joyful album. Um, not all the songs necessarily. I got I had people in tears when I sang Nona the other night at a, at a concert and I, I couldn't hold it together. They couldn't hold it together. It's just, but I do think joy is one of them. Uh, reflection. And, and movement are my kind of three. So I hope that it gets, that it kind of stirs something up within, within listeners, um, that it might tap into some emotions that are there. I kind of touch upon political slash environmental concepts, um, yeah. issues that we're dealing with. I touch on um, the emotion, raw emotions at the end of a day with, with uh, savoring the rain. And this idea of holding on to specific moments of our day that we take for granted and that we don't necessarily realize is, uh, is such a beautiful second. Can we just linger in this moment one minute longer and just enjoy, yeah. you know, the quietude of it. And, and so there is, there is kind of, a, I think, appreciation perhaps of, of the little things in our lives is something that I hope. Uh, and I know it's not going to be for everybody. It's not necessarily a, an easy record to listen to and, and, and tap your foot to. I think multiple listens definitely help. Yeah. Um, I wanted to weave in Conical. Conical was a really big element. It was incredibly helpful for me, especially throughout, throughout the pandemic, um, to delve into the, the rhythmic aspect of that and just get lost in polyrhythms, in um, complicated meters, and, and really be able to sing rhythmic phrases without worrying about lyrics without worrying about melodies um, letting the melodies kind of happen on their own just by following the percussive elements of that and how do i weave that into the jazz that i'm writing and how do i weave it into and somehow we we were able to finagle it in and bookend this record with uh with conical which means a lot to me so talk to me about the beginnings of this journey into the music for you how did it begin where were you born and raised and how did, did this kind of evolve into where we are today uh, I was born in San Francisco. I was raised in Italy. Uh, I was only in California for a few months. I think it was more of a passport thing for my mom. She was an American who was raised in Italy as of the age of 16. She was in boarding school in Italy. So she ultimately stayed here and uh, created her life here in Italy. Um, so we were, my brother and I were both raised here. We ultimately went to an American school. He had, my brother had a couple learning disabilities. Um, so we went to an American school for that purpose because Italian public school was not addressing that back in the 80s. And, um, and I had a, an incredible music teacher who opened my life. I mean, we always sang, I gotta say, singing, choral singing in general was always a part of our upbringing. Uh, on my father's side, especially, we would do a lot of harvests and harvest comes at our grape harvests and harvest comes with song. Um, so there was always traditional folk 
songs being sung well, we would perform the three of us my, my brother my father and i would sing these songs in dialect from our region um ever since i was tiny ever since i can remember really we would we would always kind of break out into these songs um and then it was this music teacher in high school and middle school um in rome at the american overseas school of rome his name is roy Zimmer, is roy zimmerman and he right now is i think leading a program in brazil for children and he just he taught me my first guitar lessons um theory of music and i started writing back then uh, i'd be curious to find some of the opus things that i <laughs> that would turn out yeah. um and then and then that kind of i would do the the, the i would sing in the square in, in, in piazza piazza di spagna in rome so the spanish steps and that was where i earned my first couple bucks Playing, I would dress like a hippie and play my guitar and strum my guitar and sing all the old, you know, old timey songs and tourists love that stuff and and I loved it. It made me happy. I would earn my ten euro and 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 go, go about the city. So that was kind of where it all really started for me. And it wasn't until later in in college, just past college, I went back to school. I graduated in English literature, and then because um, that was kind of what was expected from the family and then I went back to school to study music in Bologna and it wasn't until then that I really delved into jazz I'd always listened to jazz my mom played just Sarah Vaughn she had a she had my mom had a, a um, CD box set that was put out by um, by Playboy and it was the decades of jazz and every CD had a decade and all of a sudden it was Dave Brubeck and it was and I just got to hear phenomenal music and and um and that really opened my my eyes and my ears up to and I remember listening to Lullaby of Birdland and Sarah Vaughn and and that was when I turned to my mom I think it was in seventh grade and I turned to my mom and I said mom I want to do this in life and she said okay honey okay sure you know <laughs> it's kind of one of those yeah but I really did and I held on to that and uh and ultimately I I went back to school and when I when I did go back to school I knew that that's what I was going to do so I started in at the um Universidad de la Musica University of Music in Rome and I was studying there I had some really great teachers and uh and I remember my entrance exam, I actually was asked what song I was going to bring. And I said, well, you know, Lullaby Birdland is why I sing jazz. And so my teacher starts the company and I start singing the song. And she goes, while she's playing, she says, oh, are you going to improvise? It's like, yes, I know it by heart. And I started the improv. And of course, I knew Sarah's improv by heart. And my teacher at that, and that was a huge learning experience for me, slammed both of her hands on the piano keys and out. And that was my entrance exam. Wow. And that's plagiarism. And I just was in tears. And then I started, I had, I couldn't, I wasn't placed. So I basically started at the bottom, bottom, bottom rung. Um, and I slowly made my way up in the classes. Um, but it was a huge learning experience for me. Of course, if I had known that you could just make up your own scat and improv, huh. I wouldn't have been, you know, applying to school for the first time, perhaps. But yeah. Uh, but I learned that very, very quickly. So that yeah, for me was absolutely. a huge, huge shocker. Yeah, um, and that that's wild. Kinda, yeah. What, what was the first live jazz show you ever saw that blew you away that made you think, this is what I want to do with my life? Um, I think it was probably at Umbria Jazz uh, back in, in, in Umbria. So just being able, and I can't even remember, I can't pinpoint if there was one band in particular that did it for me. I think it was just being surrounded by so many stages with everyone playing so much jazz around me that that really kind of stayed with me. Yeah. Um, so I think I remember at a very young age and then you know, by the time I was driving, uh, I would drive myself up to the um, North Sea Jazz Festival and my dog, my dog and I would drive up to, up, Europe was very easy to get around back in it. So that was something I, and, and it was everyone, it was, I mean, I even got to see Paco de Lucia, who is not jazz at all. Yeah. And just that kind of, um, Leila James, not jazz. Um, so it was very, very fun in that respect. Yeah. Hiromi, I think was one of the biggest female musicians um, that really had an impact on me and Esperanza Spalding. Okay. Um, I joined a, there was a, um, competition, so to speak here, uh, which is ultimately what got me out of Italy and back to the States. And that was 
the idea was that whoever would win this competition with original music would then be able to open for Esperanza Spalding. And that was like my dream. Um, yeah. Ultimately, her management did not allow that. So I didn't get to open for her, but I did win the competition. Yeah. So I got to get out of Italy and go to school in LA. And then I met my husband and the rest is history. And I stayed in New York and yeah. I reconnected with Ulysses Owens, whom I'd met at a jazz camp here in Italy. And we were just, we became really, really good friends. And so when I, as soon as I got to New York in 2010, I looked him up and said, you know, hey, I'm here. What do we do? He's like, let's do something. Let's record. <laughs> so we, we did my first record and then my second record together. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's quite a beginning. So what is it that you like the best about being a professional musician? What is it that motivates you to, to continually be creative and to, to push the envelope in this genre? I feel incredibly fortunate to be able to say that I love what I do. I love, I love to be able to wake up in the morning and this is the, the thing that I'm trying to teach my children is that you actually, you can wake up and do what you love. And I, do, I, I hope with my heart that a lot of people find that in their own professions. I think jazz is so alive. It's such a breathing, living thing um, that I really can't think of another profession like it. Even in the musical sphere, I feel like you know, you get on the stage and just one small tweak of one musician's take on that solo can change uh, the entire performance, really. And, and, and the energy, that's why I don't like studio recordings that aren't live together. Um, I'm, I'm very much about, and I've had that, I've had to do that in the past, and it's just I do not work well that way. I want to be in the room, living and breathing that energy. Um, so that's, I think, what motivates me. I think that's just the privilege of being able to say that I participate in something that I'll never be able to really fully own or define or that is ever constantly changing, um, that is evolving, that evolves with me. And the fact that I can go into my my meanders, call them that, of, um, you know, whether I'm really into swing right now and I really want to write some swing songs and then, you know, I really want to get into this, this conical and let's weave in some Indian rhythms and I can just start picking and choosing from such a vast palette of colors, so to speak, um, that I, I find that's just so fun and yeah. rewarding. Uh, yeah. So what was the first stage that you had the chance to play on where you were like, I can't believe I'm playing here? Was there a moment like that when you finally got out there and started playing? You there was hobby. there there was i played with us with a funk band uh straight out of college and we did that we did a lot of like park gigs and that kind of stuff and those were fun yeah. but then when i actually joined uh this this contest it was called jazz women in blues i don't even know really what that means but but i had to write music for this and there was we got to perform in the small town of bertinoro and the entire town square was turned into this I mean, the, the landscape is incredible. It's an Italian medieval town on top of a hill. You can see all the way out to the to the water, to the ocean, uh, the ocean, the sea, I should say. Um, so it's just the, the, the backdrop is exceptional. And it was in the town square, major stage, all this light. And it wasn't a little club that I'd played. It wasn't a little park. It was actually, you know, seating and, and maybe, I don't know, 500 people there. And so that for me was a moment of realization, <gasps> maybe I can do this, hold yeah. on. If I'm actually here and I made, you know, I did this, this is me and they're here to see me. And, and it's, it was a, a moment of, I know everyone's not gonna like what I do, you know, and, and it's kind of that, I think there was Whoopi Goldberg, I think it was an interview with her and she said that something that changed her career was realizing and possibly her mother, had said you're not gonna not everybody's gonna like you all the time and that's when you're a real artist and that for me was kind of a mantra um so just knowing that you can be true to yourself and do what you love and feel feel confident in what you're doing um and it doesn't really matter if you're pleasing we're not here necessarily to please but we're here as vessels to kind of convey a universal language and some people will speak it and some people not so much and that's okay wow. Well said. So why do you love jazz? At the end of the day, what, what is it that you love about this? Again, the energy, the rhythm, the energy, I would say the rhythmic. I'm not, 
I'm not one of those singers that has a big vibrato. I don't have a huge presence. I think my strength in, in music and, and I think possibly in how I write is very much dictated by rhythmic approaches, um, different rhythmic influences and how I carry time. So I think that the freedom that I can have within that, that I'm not locked into you know, such a rigid rhythmic pulse um, necessarily, but I can play, I can, I can play around with, with polyrhythms. I can play over the bar line. I can play, you know, I can do different meters against one another. Um, that, the freedom of that, I think is, is why I love jazz. So if you could get into a time machine and go back in time and see one jazz show, where are you going? Who are you going to see? Chet Baker. I, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Any particular yeah. place? Um, I am particularly intrigued by his time after prison in Milan. I think the fact that he was in prison for a long time allowed his brain and his voice to be very, very clear, very clean, uh, not necessarily the most creative time in his career, precisely for that reason. Uh, but the quality of his sound is something that has always just fl floored me. Um, the album Chet is back and some of the arrangements that were done by Ennio Morricone for that speak very strongly to me. Um, I love his phrasing. I love his, the way he would sing, um, the breath and his sound, the, it just, I would melt in his sound. So if I could go back and, and hear anything from that time, I think that would be my, my ideal. The ah, crazy... not, no pun intended. Sorry. Right. <laughs> the, the crazy thing about how life works, though, is the vice that ultimately was the most destructive to his career was the thing that brought about the one thing that no one knew he had. Mm -hmm. No one knew he had this voice. No. You know, until the teeth got knocked out and then he had exactly. to do something different, you know. So exactly. It, it's exactly. it's wild how it works for sure. Yes. Yeah. So at the end of the day, everyone out there has a perception of you, family, friends, fans, but you run the show. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? I have no idea. I have no idea who I am. <laughs> uh, I want to say, at least for the music, uh, and I think Esperanza said this in a, sim in a similar way, and I very much agree with her. I think I'm a vessel. Yeah. I think the music is out there, and I think I just fill one of those little spots. I think you know there are a few of us that that can that can take on to it and and allow it to come through us and get penned and recorded and and I think that, that that's who I am. Um, it's been easier since I've gotten older, less it's, pressure. Certain yeah, age. <laughs> it makes everything a little easier, I think. <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> so a window within wonderful album. I urge everyone to go out Thank and you. get it. If anyone wants to get this properly to benefit you the best and to see you live, any of the good business in your world, where do they go? Uh, my website, you can write to me directly. I did print vinyl and it sounds very warm mm -hmm. and so much better in my mind than the digital. Yeah. Uh, there's a limited amount of, of prints at the moment, but I can always, we can up that. Uh, but that those have been going pretty strong and I've been selling those directly. Um, so through my website, and uh, otherwise, we have a big release show coming up at The Cutting Room in New York City. And that's on the 16th of August. I'm very excited. The band's going to be I killing. We have a, a phenomenal percussionist who's going to be joining us. Uh, Fernando Sassi is going to be on, on percussion. And then it's going to be the whole crew. Unfortunately, Vinicius can't make it. But we have uh, Guillermo Montejo uh, replacing him. So I'm very, very excited. The band is expired. It'll be fun. Yeah. OK. This has been wonderful, Olivia. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking a little time out and best of luck with the release and Thank everything you so much. else. I appreciate Thank you for it. having me. I really appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. Absolutely.